live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Friday, May 4th, 2018. Uh, that makes it uh, May the 4th. <clears throat> and, of course, that makes it Star Wars Day. And, of course, that means that I would have an uh, alien frog of some kind in my throat. And, uh, well, it's Friday. Uh, is it time to even catch up on things, or should we just sit here and wait to see what explodes on Twitter during the show. We could just do that. That's easy enough to do. Daily Coast Radio is live now, as we are reminded daily by Bill in Portland, Maine. Please rest assured that nothing KGROX says can be construed as a campaign contribution. Yes, please. All of his words are coming directly from his personal account. Very true. Ari Fleischer, I guess, spending the morning... uh, Who knows what the hell he's doing? He's spending the morning trying to defend Donald Trump over the blow-up that new Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani created yesterday by, I guess, well, I mean, what what did he do yesterday? He kind of came out and admitted that uh, Donald Trump had, in fact, paid uh, Michael Cohen back for paying off Stormy Daniels, and uh, it still hasn't settled exactly what happened there, and... uh, We're still puzzling this thing through, uh, but Ari has uh, very helpfully started, uh, well, started hanging himself and the rest of Trump world with his logical stylings. Let's see, as a matter of fact, I mean, I could launch right into things by bringing that one up. I saw Marcy Wheeler, Empty Wheel, oh, come on, computer, keep up, uh, tweeting this morning about what, Fleischer was trying to angle on. Uh, he he had a couple of tweets this morning, which were really pretty amazing. Uh, and the one that caught her eye was this one. Uh, he says, "Well, it, I guess it's a it's sort of a tweet storm, a mini tweet storm from him. He begins about an hour ago, according to Twitter, by saying uh, Bernie Sanders was also fined by the FEC. He's in in uh, tweeting in reaction." to the story from Politico that the Obama 2008 campaign turns out to have been fined by the FEC, fined $375,000, one of the largest ever against a presidential campaign. And though I am, oh, it's probably not even a, was it a new story or an old story? Let's, I mean, it's a long time to be waiting to find the 2008 campaign. Now, it's an old-ish story. Oh, look at that. A Maggie Haberman story from when she wrote for Politico in early 2013. Obama campaign fined $375,000. Fleischer seizing on the old story to say, you know, Bernie Sanders was also fined. The press didn't make a big deal of FEC violations until now when Trump is the issue. Of course, generally speaking, the FEC violations are of a somewhat different nature. It is about perhaps, uh, in in some cases, lack of... uh, 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 well, when the reports are put out, and there's enormous reports that show every contribution that you can get detailed information on a few times. Well, every once in a while, some of the uh, contributions are missing some information, and that you can get fined for. I don't even remember exactly what. And he's right. I mean, people didn't make big deals out of FEC violations. But then again, uh, you know, it was a big deal, but not a huge deal. But very few of the FEC violations were, well... I didn't report information to the FEC because I was trying to cover up the fact that I was paying cover-up money to a porn actress that I had an affair with. But that would have been a big deal, I think, in the uh, either the Sanders campaign or the Obama campaign. That probably would have made news, I must admit. Fleischer, though, pretty sure that FEC violations are only an issue for Donald Trump. And he goes on to say, I don't see how the Stormy Daniels $130,000 payment issue is an FEC matter. Think about this. A candidate for the Senate in 2018 pays hush money to a woman. Legal transaction. 
immoral but legal. Is he supposed to do that with campaign funds or personal funds? And of course, the answer is personal funds. Campaign money is not supposed to be used for personal purposes, he goes on to say. Saying Stormy's payment is an FEC violation makes a mockery of the rules stating campaign money may not be used for personal purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, he's attacking the wrong side of the issue here. What was happening, of course, was that the hush money was being paid precisely because it was a campaign issue. They wanted the payment made prior to the election because they were afraid that people, if they found out, I mean, I have a hard time believing that they really thought this was true, but they thought if people found out that might cost him the election. And so the payoff for an affair that took place allegedly in 2006 takes place, in, or was it 2000? Yeah, 2006. The payment is made 10 years later. Why is it made 10 years later? Because Donald Trump is afraid that it will affect the election campaign. And so therefore, any payment that gets made is essentially an in-kind contribution to the campaign. If you're only making the payment because it benefits the campaign, then it's hard to come to any other conclusion. Now, he goes on then to say, if paying Stormy in October is an illegal undisclosed campaign expenditure, then why isn't Stormy coming forward in October saying she wanted to go public an illegal, undisclosed, in-kind contribution to Hillary? An interesting question and a little bit absurd, but it does hold some promise. I mean, in this sense, uh, very few people, of course, would think, well, first of all, I guess there's some question about whether or not Stormy Daniels, in fact, came forward in October and said she wanted to go public. I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but I haven't followed the storyline closely enough to know whether that's really it. But uh, think about, you know, what it means for Hillary Clinton. The, the idea that uh, Stormy Daniels had a story to tell that could be damaging to Donald Trump is threatening to tell it an illegal in-kind contribution to Hillary Clinton. Well, ordinarily you would think not, because, of course, well, for one thing, you would I think what he was trying to do there is to get people to say, no, it isn't because she had nothing to do with it and she had no knowledge of it. Uh, and I guess last week he could also have said, aha, see, he had nothing to do with it and had no knowledge of it. There you are. Donald Trump is off the hook because he knew nothing about it and had no knowledge of it as well. Of course, that's inoperative now. But I thought more to the point, he was trying to show the absurdity of it and trying to get you to say, well, OK, logically, then, if it, uh, you know, either concede that Hillary Clinton should likewise be investigated somehow for this. And I, I don't know. I mean, in a way, I guess if you thought that there was a serious possibility of coming up with communications, evidence of communications between Stormy Daniels and the Hillary Clinton campaign, in which the Hillary Clinton campaign encourages her to come forward with her story in October. That might be of some interest, but then again, it's like, well, you did do this thing and we know it and we'd like to bring that forward. I don't know that it's not legitimate news, certainly. Uh, whether it's a campaign contribution poses an interesting question. And it was interesting to Marcy Wheeler in this sense. She tweets, well, you know, I think Ari Fleischer just actually confirmed that the Russian release of stolen emails that benefited the Trump campaign, whether coordinated or not, is an illegal in-kind contribution. Not sure that Mueller agrees, but Ari should let the special counsel know he wants to support his investigation. Remember, what's Fleischer saying here? Well, if Stormy, paying Stormy in October is illegal and an illegal undisclosed campaign expenditure, why isn't Stormy's demanding such payment, in other words, uh, an illegal, undisclosed, in-kind contribution to Hillary? I don't know, Ari, but if it is, then Russia's release of stolen emails that benefit the Trump campaign is an illegal, in-kind, and foreign contribution to the campaign. And I guess I'll take your word for it that you want that prosecuted. But I have a feeling you might change your mind. Just saying. Anyway... I thought it was an apt observation, and so I will therefore mark it for inclusion 
in today's uh, roundup post by Scott Anderson, which comes to you later in the day. All right, let's see. What else might we round up for discussion today? Ah, here's a story that crossed the screen just probably seconds before coming on the air here. The Hill has this story, and I I wonder where they... Uh, ah, yes, The Guardian is where they culled this one from, The Hill. Uh, it doesn't have a worldwide network of reporters. It's okay. They're a good aggregator, and I enjoy uh, making fun of their posts and or reusing their photos. I must say they, they're very adept at using, the, uh, the, using uh, imagery to catch attention for their stories on Twitter. Oh, come on now. Let's go. Uh, shall we read the 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 uh, original Guardian piece about it? I guess so. I mean, credit to bringing it to my attention for The Hill. And uh, let's see, who has the more interesting headline? Let's take this one. Well, we'll go over to The Guardian because there's probably more detail there and uh, maybe we can make more of the story. Trump set to benefit as Qatar, the country, buys $6.5 million apartment in New York Tower. Just to put a finer point on it, I'll read you the Hills headline. Qatar bought fourth condo in Trump Tower, $6.5 million. Trump Tower is the, the place we're talking about here. After emoluments lawsuit was dismissed according to this report. And, uh, well, let's see what The Guardian has to say about it. The acquisition by the Middle Eastern state came soon after a lawsuit that tried to stop the president benefiting from such deals was dismissed. Uh, oh, this is the nice uh, this is a shot of the apartment interior from the real estate listing, and it's uh, very nice and tastefully decorated unlike the rest of Trump Tower, but everybody gets to redo the interior, I guess, of their building. Nice job. The government of Qatar bought a $6.5 million apartment in one of Donald Trump's New York Towers, well, the flagship tower, soon after the dismissal of a lawsuit that tried to stop the president benefiting from such deals. They wanted to make sure that the money would get to him and wouldn't be blocked by the courts once they had the assurance that that would be okay. They went ahead and spent the money, I guess. Gutter's mission to the United Nations signed a deal for the condominium at Trump World Tower. Oh, look at that. I thought that was, uh, it's not Trump Tower, it's Trump World Tower. That makes much more sense in terms of the UN mission doing that. But the, uh, the Hills version of things has it as Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, not the UN Plaza one. Uh, hmm. And uh, I guess that's a, so that's one question. I, I mean, it makes more sense. Uh, the the Saudish already own, I think, an entire floor in Trump World Tower. Anyway, so uh, that's a slightly different story, but an interesting one nonetheless. The purchase means that the Middle Eastern state now owns four units in the building for which it has paid a total of $16.5 million dollars. So that was, let's see, the deal was inked on January 17th, according to city records. On December 21st of the prior year, a federal judge in New York had thrown out a lawsuit from ethics campaigners alleging, it was the crew lawsuit, I think, uh, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, alleging that Trump was breaching the emoluments clause of the U.S. Constitution, which he was, by collecting tens of thousands of dollars in charges from Qatar each year for the three apartments it already owned in the building. Qatar's new acquisition at Trump World Tower, which is in Manhattan's Midtown East section, coincided with an intense lobbying campaign in Washington by the Qatari government amid a regional crisis that has pitted the Gulf monarchy against the other Gulf monarchy, Saudi Arabia, and the other Gulf monarchy, the United Arab Emirates. And there are more, of course, scattered around. But interesting, yes, that they thought they could buy their way back into good graces, even in the middle of the uh, the blockade that was being supported by Jared Kushner when the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund refused to bail out his real estate empire. Whoops. Jordan Libowitz, a spokesman for Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, that's crew, 
which brought the lawsuit against Trump, said this plays to the central concern with the president's refusal to divest from his holdings, that he would be susceptible to influence from foreign countries invested in his businesses. In an unattributed email, Qatar's mission to the UN said the properties were used to house diplomatic staff close to UN headquarters. These apartments, plus the recent unit, were all purchased due to their location. Nothing more, the email said. The Trump Organization did not respond to a request for comment. The three-bedroom condominium was sold to Qatar by a pair of sisters who bought it for $5 million in 2007. Trump owns the surrounding building, according to his real estate portfolio, and his company has paid monthly charges by residents. An archived listing for Qatar's newest condominium said the common charges and maintenance fees totaled $3,151 a month. So, to be clear... The purchase price of $6.5 million allegedly does, well, as far as we know, doesn't go to him. I don't know who the pair of sisters are who own it or what their relationship, if any, with Trump is. But the $6.5 million price tag doesn't seem to have anything to do with the amount of money that Trump makes from the transaction. Trump gets $3,151 a month in condo charges. Michael Cohen makes an appearance in this piece. Michael Cohen, Trump's embattled legal fixer, owned an apartment in the same building until October of last year when he sold it for $3.3 million. Cohen's wife's parents own four apartments in the building, according to city filings. The property bought by Gutter was touted as, quote, truly top of the line, offering residents spectacular views along with the use of a spa and swimming pool. Crew's lawsuit said the governments of Afghanistan, India, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia were already paying more than $225,000 a month in charges for space in the building. The Qatari monarchy has been scrambling to regain its footing with the U.S. since Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies imposed an embargo, a blockade, in June of last year. And they are technically two different things, and I think that they should probably get that one right. I don't think it's an embargo. I think it's an actual blockade. Trump initially threw his backing behind Riyadh, uh, although other senior U.S. officials rushed to express support for Qatar because, well, tuned, finely tuned machine. I think that's the way he puts it. Uh, They supported Qatar, which is, of course, home to Al-Yudid Air Base, which houses the U.S. military's Central Command and 10,000 American troops. Throughout the crisis, Gutter has continued to buy U.S. weaponry in large quantities. A $12 billion deal for F-15 jets was announced last summer. The Qataris also pay for the cost of maintaining al Udid and have promised significant upgrades to the facilities for U.S. troops and their families. This spring, the Emirate has put in further orders worth another half billion dollars for U.S. guidance systems and precision-guided missiles for helicopters, just ahead of a visit to the White House in April by the Emir Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. They are certainly spending a lot of money trying to influence the shape of the debate in Washington, said Gerald Firestein, a former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, now at the Middle East Institute in Washington. Qatari money was behind the creation of a D.C. based think tank, the Gulf International Forum, in February. And since last June, when the blockade began, the Doha government has spent over $5 million on lobbying firms in an effort to match the Saudis. The way they are competing is going to allow a lot of Washington lobbyists to buy vacation homes this year, Firestein said. Trump broke with decades of presidential convention by retaining ownership of his businesses even after entering the White House. His decision created dozens of possible conflicts of interest, and was heavily criticized by former ethics officials from past Democratic and Republican administrations. The president has been accused of violating a section of the U.S. Constitution prohibiting people in public office from receiving gifts or emoluments from any king, prince, or foreign state. Trump's attorneys argue that simple payments for services at fair market value are not emoluments. In his December decision, Judge George Daniels ruled in Manhattan's federal court that the lawsuit brought by Crew represented a or presented a non-justiciable political question 
that old political question doctrine. That was a matter for Congress rather than the courts. He said the ethics campaigners and their partners on the lawsuit were not entitled to sue. Does that mean that they also lacked standing? The crew is a uh, crew. The organization known as crew is appealing against the decision. Uh, so it ain't, it ain't settled yet. A separate lawsuit alleging emoluments violations, which focuses on spending by foreign officials at Trump's hotel in Washington, D.C., has been brought by the attorneys general of Maryland and the District of Columbia. Uh, a ju- I don't know, does the District of Columbia have an attorney general per se? I don't know. A judge ruled in March that the case had cleared an initial hurdle and could proceed. The lawsuit incorporates some of the allegations made by Crew, which has joined the legal team behind it. So uh, a premature if they really thought, the Qataris, that uh, they were absolutely going to get away with this thing. But I, I, I do think that they probably, I mean, it's a pretty minimal amount that goes directly to the Trump organization in any case. And uh, I'm not saying that they're not guilty of trying to influence Washington or Trump himself, they surely are. That's just a particularly, I, I think, a small bore and relatively ineffective way of doing the trick. But I'm glad that the question is being raised because uh, I think it's being done with a little bit here and a little bit there. Some at the hotel, some at Trump World Tower, and who knows where else. And uh, pretty soon we'll, I'm sure, get uh, word of uh, bulk orders of Trump wine <laughs> or uh, buying out the entire existing stock, which is to say none, of Trump stakes or God knows what else, Trump water, who knows. Anyway, speaking of international relations and international affairs and Donald Trump tinkering with them or undermining them completely for perhaps uh, reasons of personal financial gain or because he's a crazy conspiracy theorist wacko, The Hill also has this story by Brett Samuels on the State Department freezing funding for a famed Syrian humanitarian group, according to this report. The State Department has reportedly frozen funding for a humanitarian group working in Syria, threatening the group's effectiveness. CBS News, I guess, has the original on this one, reporting on Thursday that the State Department has put funding for the White Helmets group under active review as it determines which foreign aid programs to continue funding. The White Helmets have essentially served as emergency responders in the war-torn country. Meanwhile, the U.S. had provided roughly one-third of the group's total funding. CBS reported, This is a very worrisome development, an official with the White Helmets told CBS about the funding freeze. Ultimately, this will negatively impact the humanitarian workers' ability to save lives. That sounds like a pretty crappy thing to do. Uh, let's see. I was wondering if we might get some more background about, uh, the White Helmets group from the CBS News report. The White Helmets, formerly known as the Syrian Civil Defense, are a group of 3,000 volunteer rescuers that have saved thousands of lives since the Syrian Civil War began in 2011. A makeshift 911. They have run into the collapsing buildings into, uh, well, it says the collapsing buildings, uh, probably any collapsing buildings, to pull children, men, and women out of danger's way. They say they have saved more than 70,000 lives. Having not received U.S. funding in recent weeks, I'm now reading from the CBS report on this, White Helmets are questioning what this means for the future. They have received no formal declaration from the U.S. government that the monetary assistance has come to a full halt, but the group's people on the ground in Syria report that the funds have been cut off. So no courage, of course, to come out and say, yes, we're actually doing this, uh, a real hallmark of the Trump administration, just like the way he fires people, essentially. Uh, Let's see. Oh, here's another new piece of information that came across the Twitter transom as we were getting ready for air. Alan Smith writing in Business Insider, the headline, the Trump Organization just quietly announced, it's always quietly announcing these things, it's collecting sales tax In a new state, weeks after Trump savaged Amazon over its policies. Of course, you all know Amazon owned by Jeff Bezos, which also owns, who also owns, maybe which is the right word. Uh, The Washington Post, uh, with which Trump is constantly at war because they keep telling us what a disgusting, 
an awful human being and terrible president he is. And so uh, Trump has made every uh, taken every opportunity to attack both the Washington Post and Amazon. But uh, in particular, yeah, the, uh, the the claim was that Amazon was cheating government out of millions and perhaps more of dollars collected that they could be collecting in sales taxes, but refusing to do it. And it was an unfair competitive advantage. And Bezos was uh, had become rich by cheating on his taxes, which is an odd allegation, of course, for Donald Trump to be leveling at anyone. But you know how he can be. The Trump Organization, we have some uh, bullet point subheaders here to uh, add from the Business Insider piece. The Trump Organization, oh, you know what? It occurs to me. Where is, I don't even know where my uh, my phone and my alarm are missing. And I'm thinking, okay, when is the break coming up? And the answer is I have put it away somewhere. I'm going to have to monitor things uh, manually, although the alarm will start ringing probably across the room in just a few seconds. And I'll use the two-minute break to go retrieve it wherever it is. Oh, look at that. All right, you hear it? There it is. Okay, well, I left it across the room. And it's going to ring in the background uh, until we take our break. The Trump Organization updated its online retailer's website to include New York, believe it or not, as a state where it collects sales taxes. The update comes after President Donald Trump has attacked Amazon over the issue of sales tax collection. So I guess caught out on that one. I'm I'm surprised, quite honestly, that he bothered to respond to it by actually collecting taxes so that he didn't look like such a hypocrite. Um, I'm not really, that's not actually in keeping with what he does. He usually just continues to be a hypocrite and just deny that it's the case. Well, the Trump Organization uh, specifically has updated the list of states on which its online retailer, TrumpStore.com, collects sales taxes to include New York. What do they sell over there? We should take a look at that during the break, plus find that alarm. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. And send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Over the break, okay, I did find the phone. It was, in fact, left on the counter across the room. Ordinarily, it is right here by my side with the volume turned down so that you perhaps only hear a slight buzzing in the background and little else but a hectic morning. Last of the uh, early mornings for the high school junior on his way to review uh, material for the upcoming AP U.S. History exam, or APUSH, as the kids call it these days, and I guess the adults too, because that's the name of the course. All right, so <clears throat> uh, with him out of the way and everybody out of the house early today, uh, it's nice to have a, a couple of minutes of quiet before the show. Usually not the case. Usually he leaves for the bus, or sometimes I have to drive him down the street to make sure he catches the bus, just literally minutes before airtime. Uh, it's nice when they're all out of the house on the early side, but then the schedule gets screwed up, and I do wacky things like sit down on the other side of the room and put my phone down. Anyway, I told you over the break I was going to take a look at the Trump store, trumpstore.com, where they are now collecting sales tax in New York, according to... Uh, this piece here in, oh, what were we looking at here? Uh, whose story were we looking at? I don't even remember. I think it was another Hill story. Did I lose that story already? Where did that go to? I got the guitar. There we are. It's, uh, no, that's the Guardian store about the U.S. freezes. The, uh, there we are. Business Insider. That was saying, uh, yeah, after attacking Amazon for its failure, I guess, to collect 
sales, taxes, they realized, hey, we're not doing it either. And I thought, what do they sell over at the Trump store? Probably garbage, and it is, and uh, I got a good laugh out of it too. The splash page, you know, it, it, it's a typical Trumpy thing. It's got the big gold letters Trump, and then like fancy uh, script for the word store, but just uh, of the kind that's overly fancy, like you might find on a wedding invitation or something. Donald Trump's idea of true class. Well, anyway, they got a Mother's Day uh, promotional coming up here. And, uh, you know, they sell Trump branded crap. Uh, For instance, for Mother's Day, the uh, promotional item that they have a picture up of is, uh, you know, when you stay at like a Trump hotel or any any kind of fancy hotel and they'll they'll sell you one of the robes that they have there. Uh, as if like, yeah, I, I can't wait to buy this hotel bathrobe that unknown numbers of people have been wearing naked as they stepped out of the showers. Give me one of those. I've never really understood how that happened, except that I think Beverly Hills cop maybe uh, popularized that. Didn't he stay at the Beverly Hills hotel? And then he was amazed that you could buy the bathrobes or something. Maybe I have my cultural references uh, backwards here. But anyway, the Mother's Day promotion is, uh, for instance, you can buy a Trump Hotel, a fabulous Trump Hotel bathrobe, the Trump Hotel slippers as well that are just white terry cloth looking slippers that have Trump embroidered on them. And then there's some Trump bath products, I guess, is what's being displayed there as well. They will gift wrap for you. Fantastic. And uh, they'll put your crap in a box that says Trump store on it. There's ladies apparel, and it appears to be mostly golfing apparel, or at least that's what's most prominently featured. And then, LOL, everybody, you can buy glassware and buy sets of wine glasses from the Trump, I guess, reminiscent of the Trump winery. What else can you buy? The big LOL uh, issue here, of course, I just tweeted out. If you're listening to the show live, you will have seen it go out via Twitter. The section is labeled glassware, uh, G-L-A-S-S-W-E-A-R, glassware. I can't believe it. I mean, what a bunch of idiots. They can't even get this stuff spelled right on, on the commercial side. I find that astonishing. Anyway, Let's see. Uh, so for men, you can buy uh, polo shirts. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Don't. All right. Let me have the thing back. Uh, polo shirts, hats, T-shirts, outerwear, golf accessories. Do, hats. Do they sell Trump like uh, MAGA hats? No. They uh, have some. Although they have a red hat that just says Trump in white lettering. That's meant to be reminiscent, I think, of the MAGA hat. That goes for thirty-five bucks. And then, uh, I don't know. So they got one, two, like a bunch of, uh, one, two, three, four, five golf caps. And then two, as they say, traditional winter hat. That is to say, one of the, uh, a knit hat with one of the pom poms on the top. One in what looks to be sort of red, white, and blue. Looks like it could be, you know, giants colors or something and one that looks like a Pittsburgh Steelers had uh, red or uh, black and and gold and uh, they're fairly dumb looking <clears throat> traditional winter hats I guess you would say a toque uh, is that right in Canada uh, and one of the one of the hats is emblazoned with the logo blue monster which I think is uh, one of the uh, that may, is that the is that the 17th hole at the Doral uh golf course i think that's like the the island green par three is that the blue monster blue monster it's not really much of a monster i mean maybe not or maybe it is ah here we go uh a better explanation here i was gonna say like a par three you can't really call a monster it's monstrous to have to shoot at the island green i guess but that's not what it is according to this write-up you are proudly displaying your love for the 7608 yard world-class course Located at Trump National Doral. We at least have that with the blue monster hat. I, I don't know. Is that like, uh, is, is the, is that the blue tees like long? It's so long that it's a monster. I don't even know. I'm not, I, I'm, that's actually a part of golf lore that I don't give a goddamn about one way or the other. Anyway, 
Interesting. Not news. For women, similar stuff. Polos, hats, T-shirts, outerwear. Kids, uh, T-shirts and infant and toddler stuff. Gifts section, Mother's Day, spa, home, travel, golf, pets, and collectibles. And then Trump. Just Trump, like uh, things that say Trump on them. And then Trump golf, specifically. So, all right. I'm sort of interested. What do they have for pets? They have a pet bandana that says Trump on it, a dog throw toy that says Trump on it, and a woven heavy-duty elite, so elite, collar. Uh, And then I guess a woven heavy-duty elite pet leash. For $25, you can have a pet leash that says Trump all over it, which I imagine is probably big on the S&M set, but I don't know for sure. Quite honestly, it's awfully humiliating, I can assure you of that. Anyway, I just thought I'd bring you up to date on that one and uh, share the fact that they misspelled glassware, which is just astonishing, but surely not news. Yes, we can move on. Okay, what have we got in pocket to share with you today? There's an awful lot. Um, You may have seen also this morning on Twitter, Neil Cavuto uh, doing a segment on his Fox what is it Fox Business Channel? What, what are they, uh, where does he broke his Fox News Channel? This is uh, Chiron here. Uh, and he's got a, a, a rather lengthy segment. I don't know whether he it says, uh, catch Neil's latest common sense. Neil Cavuto's team tweets out, and I guess that's his segment in which he, he says something sensible every once in a while. And uh, it's awfully... Harsh and critical of Trump, which is an unusual thing to say. But basically, he's compiled all of the uh, latest reasons why you can't believe anything Trump says. And he's been a little iffy on Trump the whole time. Uh, But I'll include that for you to uh, enjoy for the weekend. And I think an important part of what's been rounded up uh, in the week and things you may talk about. If you're, for instance, not going to be in theaters watching uh, Avengers Infinity War, where they would shush you about for talking about such things. And a lot of places, they'll shush you for talking about Trump. And, and honestly, I think you should take their direction. Uh, was thinking about going to see the movie with the kids this weekend when I realized I don't care about the movie, but my wife does, and she's going to go with them. And I was going to go with them just to be like together as a family. But now it turns out that I have another obligation over the weekend. Uh, which is actually like fun. And so I'll be taking care of that one. And uh, the kids wouldn't want to be involved in that. So we all win. I don't have to see Infinity War until it uh, plays incessantly on cable, uh, by which point I will know all of the people who died and it won't bother me in the least because they're comic book characters and I'm okay with that. All right, let's see. Uh, Also in the news today here, an interesting story. This must be shared up towards the top of the show. I have it via the tweet of Caitlin Kelly, who is uh, listed as roving senior features editor at Vice. And, uh, well, she's doing a good job there. This is a great story. Who's uh, reporting? Is it the Washington Post? She grabs this quote from the piece, which is what caught my eye. It is about Scott Pruitt, and he just becomes a worse and worse case of corruption As minutes pass, after taking office last year, she quotes, Pruitt drew up a list of at least a dozen countries he hoped to visit and urged aides to help find him official reasons to travel to those countries. This uh, let's just click through to the piece and read it. That's about as blatant. Uh, a batch o personal corruption as you could possibly have. That guy is a is like world class scumbag, and if he doesn't go to prison, nothing matters. That's all there is to it. Influential outsiders. The headline reads: Have played a key role in Scott Pruitt's foreign travel. Yeah, we did here the other day, and I didn't get to share the story of this discovery made. Uh, This pattern set forth in his initial trip to Morocco, which never made any goddamn sense at all. And it turns out it's not the only one. So let's catch up with the reporting here this time. Juliet Alperin and Brady Dennis have put this piece together. This ran in yesterday's Washington Post. 
Scott Pruitt's itinerary for a February trip to Israel was remarkable by any standard for an Environmental Protection Agency administrator. A stop at a controversial Jewish settlement in the West Bank, which unless it's fantastically green, I can't imagine you would have any interest in whatsoever. And really, quite honestly, you should be visiting an American facility and not stepping into this controversy. But what the hell? But of course, he has to be totally political about it. And, you know, if he, this is uh, about his being able to run, I guess, for governor of Oklahoma and say, I'm a strong supporter of Israel and the settlements, etc. All right. What else? An appearance at Tel Aviv University, a hard to get audience with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Although I would imagine if you were sending a cabinet minister there for a real reason, you would hope that he would get some time with the PM. One force behind Pruitt's eclectic agenda Casino magnate and Republican megadonor Sheldon Adelson, a major supporter of Israel who arranged parts of Pruitt's visit. The Israel trip was canceled days before Pruitt's planned departure, Uh after the Washington Post revealed his penchant for first-class travel on the taxpayer's dime. But federal documents obtained by the Post and interviews with individuals familiar with the trip reveal that it fit a pattern by Pruitt of planning foreign travel with significant help from outside interests, including lobbyists, Republican donors, and conservative activists. Lock him up. After taking office last year, Pruitt drew up a list of at least a dozen countries he'd hoped to visit, uh, you know, because he's a government official, and this is hitting the jackpot for him. Fancy cars, private dining rooms, first-class travel, maybe even private jet travel all over the world, Well, won't it interfere with your ability to do the job as Environmental Protection Agency Administrator here at home? No, I don't plan to do that job. I'm just collecting the money and living a jet-setting lifestyle on someone else's dime. That's what government service is to Scott Pruitt. So, first thing he does, gets into office, writes down a bucket list of countries he hopes to visit and people he hopes to squeeze in order to get them to pay for it. According to four people familiar with the matter who spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss internal agency deliberations, Pruitt then enlisted well-connected friends and political allies to help make the trips happen. Longtime Pruitt friend Richard Smotkin, for example, helped arrange, helped arrange Pruitt's four-day visit to Morocco in December. There's that story. Do we have the same reporters on that one? By the way, I was curious whether this is just more follow-up on that uh no well yes uh kevin sullivan joined in the byline on that one actually got top billing over juliet elperin and brady dennis that time but let's continue with yesterday's installment so that we're as up to date as possible uh let's see smotkin who has not returned calls seeking comment later signed a forty thousand dollar a month lobbying contract with the moroccan government american australian council treasurer Matthew Friedman, whose group members include Conoco Phillips, helped line up a September trip to Australia, because also very important that the EPA administrator get to the other side of the earth, where Pruitt was scheduled to promote liquefied natural gas exports during a tour of the company's natural gas facility. That trip was also canceled. That was also the premise of the Morocco trip, too, I think. Friedman did not respond to calls seeking comment. The council said it, quote, authorized Friedman to, quote, have discussions with the EPA about the trip. And in Israel, Pruitt was scheduled to unveil an agreement with WaterGen, an Israeli water purification company championed by Adelson. Adelson does not have a financial stake in WaterGen, according to his aides and the company, but was impressed by its technology and had urged Pruitt to meet with water gen executives soon after he took office. That meeting took place on March 29th, 2017. In other words, soon after he took office. Within weeks, Pruitt instructed his aides to find a way to procure water gen's technology, according to two administration officials who spoke on the condition of anonymity for fear of retaliation, because that's another of his scandals, The EPA signed an agreement with the company in January. Pruitt had hoped to announce it while he was in Israel. WaterGen is now working with the EPA technical staff in Cincinnati to test its technologies in hopes of obtaining a federal contract to provide drinking water in places where the water supply has been contaminated. And I'm sure that the water supply could use improvement in Cincinnati, but I I mean, 
Flint, maybe? Because then you would actually look like a good guy for trying to do that. Anyway, let's see. Embedded here uh, after is a tweet from Watergen. You can find them at uh, Watergen underscore Inc. It's W-A-T-E-R-G-E-N underscore I-N-C on Twitter if you want to see this thing. Uh, And it's a picture. President Donald Trump recently hosted a delegation from Watergen USA, a subsidiary of of Watergen Israel, at his resort estate in Mar-a-Lago, Florida. And you can tell it's one of his properties because it's practically a flame in gold macaroni. Anyway, on Thursday, Adelson's top political advisor, Andy Aboud, A-B-B-O-U-D. Interesting. Let's look into that guy's background. Shall we? Let's, uh, well, why isn't he being uh, deported? He's clearly foreign. I, well, I don't know. Andy suggested maybe he's not, but who cares? It doesn't matter if you're the wrong kind of foreigner. Why not throw him out too? Confirmed, uh, let's see, Adelson's top political advisor confirmed his involvement in planning Pruitt's Israel agenda, but played down its significance, saying many people consult Adelson before making the journey. In some cases, we will make an introduction to various officials traveling to Israel and Israeli staff officials, Aboud said. Of the planned Pruitt trip, he said, it was very perfunctory, and I would describe them as simple introductions. Of course, because you're not a crazy lawyer like Rudy Giuliani, who would say, oh yeah, it was huge and total bribery. What's the problem? In an email, EPA spokesman Jahan Wilcox said agency officials in the international, I'm sorry, the Office of International and Tribal Affairs organized and led the effort around Administrator Pruitt's trip to Israel, as well as planned journeys to Italy, Morocco, Mexico, and Australia. Wilcox declined to answer questions about Adelson's role, water gen, or other travel-related matters. Pruitt's practice of involving outsiders in his travels raises serious ethical concerns, as you might imagine. Legal experts said federal law prohibits public officials from using their office to enrich themselves or any private individual or to offer endorsements. Late Thursday, Democratic Senators Thomas Carper of Delaware and Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island wrote to Pruitt, strongly worded letter, Seeking more information about the Israel trip, the agency's agreement with Watergen, and the role of Mr. Adelson or other non-governmental officials. Uh, Along with Israel and Australia, Pruitt's wish list for global travel included Saudi Arabia, where maybe he hoped to get one of those big medals and some gifts and things, Colombia, Panama, Poland, don't forget Poland, Japan, India, and Canada. Now, how could an American get to Canada without help from the outside? I'd like to know. Former staff members said, adding that Pruitt asked staffers to schedule the trips at a pace of roughly one per month so that, what, he didn't have to pay that much rent at the uh, lobbyist's apartment, I guess. Political and career officials at the EPA suggested a handful of other destinations. (laughs) Don't add anything. Including China and Germany. I guess if I was completely corrupt and thought that I could travel for free around the world whenever I wanted to for no particular reason on somebody else's dime and to do it in style and with a security team and all that, that would be the time for me to go to China and India and, uh, you know, Egypt and all the places to see the great sites in places that I otherwise might have some security concerns about or not be able to afford. But I'm A, not a government official and be not wholly corrupt. Yet, you can still corrupt me, of course. Everyone should probably send me thousands of dollars via PayPal or, for that matter, uh, <laughs> via Patreon or uh, uh, Cash Me app, whatever, whatever you want to use to send me the money, and uh, I will be in your pocket forever. I'm probably, probably very easy to bribe. I have not thought this through yet. But, uh, well, I'll try to make it easier for you. Or maybe I will listen more closely to the bribes of longtime Patreon subscribers first. Eh, is that uh, legit? Can I do- All right. Well, anyway, here's what Scott Pruitt is up to. In uh, Let's see. So far, Pruitt has only made it to Italy and Morocco. Darn it. He's canceled trips to Australia, Japan, and Israel after extensive advance work by EPA officials. So the money's been wasted. He didn't even get to enjoy the trips. In Italy and Morocco, Pruitt granted his friends unusual access to official events. 
In Italy, for example, Pruitt met up in Rome with Leonard Leo, executive vice president of the Conservative Federalist Society. Who pays for that? Nobody knows. Leo, who's Catholic, personally arranged private events for Pruitt and his aides, including a private tour of the Vatican Library and the Apostolic Palace, according to a participant in the trip. Was he mad about the uh, house chaplain being fired? Perhaps. But, oh, yes, more news on that front as well. He's back. He has unresigned. And he apparently sent a hot, flaming, unresignation letter to Paul Ryan, who beta cucked his way out of that situation and said, I accept your unresignation, which I I don't even know what to think about that. But OK, uh, it seems to be an embarrassment for Paul Ryan. So I'm OK with that. Anyway, no word on what Leonard Leo has to say about that. And what a name, Leonard Leo. Hmm. Leo Leo, essentially. Uh, he's friends with Eric Erickson. When Pruitt left a private Vatican mass for a discussion of environmental policy with Archbishop Paul Gallagher, really, he invited Leo to join the meeting, according to two participants on the Italy trip. Leo declined Thursday to comment. Did he go and join? So we don't know. I guess he invited Leo to join the meeting. Did he leave to join the meeting? I mean, left a private Vatican mass for a discussion with him. I mean, at least it was for environmental policy discussion and with an archbishop. But I mean, are they saying he like he left early? I mean, how rude is that? Somebody arranges a private Vatican mass for you and you're like, yeah, I got to go. Anyway, in Morocco, Smotkin, that guy, joined Pruitt's entourage on multiple stops, including a meeting with one of the kingdom's most prominent business leaders, according to three individuals familiar with the trip. Legal experts said it is highly unusual for private citizens to participate in official meetings when cabinet members travel overseas and that such invitations could be construed as tacit endorsements of a group's agenda. Federal ethics rules prohibit public officials from endorsing any product, service, or enterprise, said Don Fox, a former acting director of the Office of Government Ethics. But you know all those guys are compromised because they like ethics. So don't listen to them. Very interesting. And of course, by the way, reminiscent of the times when Donald Trump has invited Mar-a-Lago members to sit in on interviews for cabinet positions or uh, inadvertently invited them to listen in on national security discussions about North Korean missile tests as well. From his days, from his first days at the EPA, Pruitt made clear to top aides that Israel was high on his agenda. Pruitt had met Adelson while serving as Oklahoma Attorney General and agreed when Adelson suggested he meet with executives from Watergen. Yehuda Kaplun, Kaplun, it's Kaplan in America, but K-A-P-L-O-U-N, president of Watergen USA, said Thursday that Adelson became an enthusiastic backer after learning about the company's innovative method of drawing potable water from moisture in the air. That is interesting. It is also, uh, you know what else has that technology? Earth. But, okay. That, I mean, it's good to be able to do it on demand rather than waiting for it to fall out of the sky in the natural fashion. And uh, in the, uh, for instance, say, maybe the desert atmosphere, and uh, Israel is not entirely desert by any stretch of the imagination, but if you were perhaps drawing moisture from the air, in the, well, if you're drawing moisture from the air in the desert, you're really performing miracles, but okay. Anyway, uh, interesting. While Adelson had no investments or other financial involvement in the company, Kaplan said, he asked executives whether we'd be prepared to meet with EPA. On March 29th, 2017, Kaplan and the parent company's executive chairman, Maxim Pasik, met with Pruitt in his office in Washington. The entry in Pruitt's official calendar, released under a public records request, includes a note that reads, This came as a request of Sheldon Adelson. I don't know why you would put that, but thanks. Watergen executives brought along one of the company's home and office units, which can produce three to five gallons of water a day, and removed it, from Pruitt's office about a week later. Uh, so interesting. So it's like a home and office, you know, three to five gallons of water a day. It is a dehumidifier, ladies and gentlemen. It is, uh, uh, you can do the same. Well, honestly, I guess if you put a bucket underneath a leaky uh, window unit air conditioner, you could be doing the same. Now, it's a good idea. 
Uh, and not even a bad idea. Really. They should air condition Israel. It's a terrific thought. Um, but uh, it's a dehumidifier. And that's nice. I mean, I don't know how innovative it is, but look, you know, if you can sit a machine down and uh, produce three to five gallons of water a day with minimal effort, that's a pretty good thing. The administrator's goal, which he stated at the meeting, is that this can help people. It can give people clean air and water, Kaplan said, adding that Pruitt mentioned the Flint, Michigan drinking water crisis as one potential use. Oh, good idea. At least that happened. I'm, I'm glad it wasn't completely out of his mind. I mean, he's completely out of his mind, but I'm glad that Flint at least registers on his radar from th when he's trying to pose as being EPA administrator. Pasik had a follow-up meeting with Pruitt in May, according to Pruitt's calendar, and a few months later, the EPA announced that it was seeking up to four private sector partners for a cooperative research and development agreement to investigate the potential use of atmospheric water generators. Not a bad idea if you could plant a bunch of those around Flint and elsewhere, I guess. I don't know who pays for it and what you give up in exchange for it, but it's a nice thought. Such agreements often involve multiple firms. In this case, the EPA has so far cemented an agreement only with WaterGen in January. It was scheduled to be unveiled in February during Pruitt's trip to Israel, but because he didn't get to go and have fun in Israel, I guess he never got around to it. That's not very nice. Many of the planned stops on that trip were the sort that any EPA administrator might, in fact, undertake, according to Pruitt's itinerary, for example. He was scheduled to meet with ministers of environmental protection and energy, visit a wastewater facility in Jerusalem, and stop at one of the world's largest desalination plants. Other proposed stops, though, less clearly related to his mission, such as excursions to the city of David and the Galilee region, where Jesus once preached, just before Pruitt was scheduled to depart, an Adelson associate met Pruitt aides Millen Hupp and Sarah Greenwald in Israel to hammer out details of some of those events, according to another person familiar with those meetings. But we'll be back to talk about it more after this. Welcome back now to the Gagro in the Morning Show. Guess what? The first successful, well, it's not done yet, but there we are, yes. First successful use of my uh, finally produced shortened uh, one minute break music so that I don't have to trouble with uh, figuring out how to fade the stuff out. So terrific. Wonderful. I'm glad I got it done. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay. Another interesting article that we might share with you. Let's uh, continue on and see if there's anything else that we can scrape out of the, uh, the story of, uh, 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 uh who was it? Oh, yes. The, uh, terrible, Guy, Scott Pruitt over at EPA and his travels. I think we're nearing the end here. And I, I will share the comment and the uh, and sentiment of the warlock pointing out Pruitt will not be going to prison. That is probably true. He really, I mean, like many others, deserves it. But it's very, very rare that anybody gets called out on these things and finds themselves in prison. But uh yeah, it should be happening, but it won't be. Uh, and he also asks, by the way, do you think Dems should run on impeachment? Now, we did address this the other day. Uh, so I refer you, I refer the honorable gentleman, I guess, Warlock, right, to the reply I gave some days ago. Uh, I am of mixed feelings about that, but really, uh, I can't spend time on that again because I could, I absolutely could. I could spend another hour on it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to continue with this other piece here. And uh, let's see. So although the trip to Israel was canceled, EPA testing of WaterGen's technology continues. And that's nice. At least he didn't hold that up and uh, say, well, if I don't get my free trip to Israel, you can't help people in the United States get water. Federal officials said a second company, Aqua Sciences, could soon be added to the agreement. Where are they based? Anywhere interesting? Kaplan said that WaterGen fo followed total protocol. That's an awkward way of saying it, but okay. In seeking EPA approval, and that as far as he knew, no other firms had initially applied. Applied what? Applied for bringing him to where they were based? Or for the grants or what? Our technology is so advanced. How advanced is it? It's so advanced that no one else is in the same realm. It sounds very Trumpian. Clouds are in the same realm, but okay. 
uh, adding that Watergen had sold, shouldered the cost of delivering one of its units to the EPA lab. Wow, holy macaroni. Can't believe they delivered one of its units, one of their units, to a place. Now, they make units for the home or office, and they brought one all by themselves to an office. Look out. Okay, whatever. Kaplan and Watergen's U.S. CEO, Edward Russo, a former environmental consultant to Donald Trump, who authored a book titled Donald J. Trump, an environmental hero. <laughs> I'm sorry, I guess it didn't come out entirely clear. An environmental hero, uh, by which I mean sandwich. I mean, the Do Donald J. Trump, an environmental hero, visited the president's Mar-a-Lago estate in March. They briefed Trump about the technology, and the president invited them to the Oval Office for a demonstration, Kaplan said. Pour me a glass of water. I hate that. Bring me a Diet Coke. If you can produce Diet Coke from the air, you got a product. So that's the deal. Kaplan uh, uh, is a, uh, who cares? Watergen's U.S. CEO is Edward Russo. He's a former environmental consultant to Donald Trump who wrote the book Donald J. Trump, Environmental Hero. So that's how they get the contract. And Adelson probably had almost nothing to do with it. I'll arrange some details on the trip for you, but that's it. Uh, you know, but, but the reason that you're in the running is because the U S CEO for this company is a Donald Trump sycophant. Okay. That seems like a buried lead, but okay. This was supposed to be about Scott Pruitt and he is in fact an awful human being. Can't get him into prison, but he's an awful guy. All right. What else have we got here? Oh yes. Here was an interesting development fantastic awesome to find out former cia chief says russians were behind that texas furor over jade helm you remember that this is the san antonio news express uh peggy fikach i'm gonna guess is the name f-i-k-a-c uh look at this so datelined down there in austin russians were behind the texas furor over the jade helm 15 federal military exercise, which drew so much concern that Governor Greg Abbott directed the state guard to monitor the operation. Former CIA director Michael Hayden said on MSNBC. Uh, again, we don't like to believe things that Michael Hayden says, but I find that very interesting as a possibility. Uh, it does sound like the sort of thing that the Russians would fan the flames on. Anyway, and I did, I think I saw some reports yesterday that suggested that they didn't originate the conspiracy theory, but uh, upon their discovery of it, they were more than pleased to fan the flames of it, probably as one of their initial testing grounds. Can we drive conspiratorial minded Americans to insanity, like right straight over the edge? And 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 do uh, cause American officialdom who are interested in courting conspiracy theory minded wacko Americans into committing American resources, particularly I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they didn't even have any remote hope of a jackpot like this, but getting National Guard troops, actual American military to change plans or waste additional resources monitoring an American armed forces maneuver. That's an incredible bonus. Anyway, they probably didn't even dream about that one. Hayden, a retired Air Force general who also headed the National Security Agency in 1995 through 2005, was on Wednesday's podcast by Morning Joe. What, they couldn't squeeze Michael Hayden into the television uh, side of this? He has a new book. The Assault on Intelligence, American National Security in an Age of Lies, and discussed Russia's focus on information warfare. Russians took their game to North America in 2015, said Hayden, who was CIA director under George W. Bush. That accounts for the 1999 to 2005 thing. There was an exercise in Texas called Jade Helm 15. I remember it, of course. Russian bots and the American alt-right media convinced most, many Texans, many, not most, but many Texans, that's what it says, that Obama planned to round up political dissidents. And just to be clear here, Hayden's quote reads, 
that they convinced most, many Texans. He corrects himself, I think, is what this is meant to indicate. He got so much traction, the governor of Texas had to, no he didn't, call out the National Guard to observe the federal exercise to keep the population calm, Hayden said. At that point, I'm figuring the Russians are saying, we can go big time. At that point, I think they made the decision, we're going to play in the electoral process. Could be. Contrary to Hayden's comment, Abbott did not activate the Texas National Guard, but instead called out the Texas State Guard to observe Jade Helms' uh, operation. The State Guard is an all-volunteer entity that assists with state missions such as hurricane recovery. And so I guess people weren't necessarily being paid because they're all volunteer, but I'm sure state resources were being spent. But an important point and an important distinction, it wasn't the Texas National Guard. That wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense, but neither did anything having to do with Jade Helm hysteria. Uh, what about the, the tunnels underneath the Walmarts? How did that get in there? The San Antonio Express News, which obtained correspondence to and from Abbott's office regarding the exercise, found that many people wrote or called with concerns about the possibility of martial law and closed Walmarts, there it is, being prepared as detention camps. <laughs> That's how big those stupid stores are. The Texas Democratic Party drew attention to Hayden's comments and jabbed at Abbott, calling him a Russian pawn and a useful idiot for Russian efforts to instill fear and distrust in our American institutions. I don't know how useful he is, but I think he is an idiot. Abbott's staff didn't have an immediate comment. The Democrats who were battling in a runoff for their party's nomination to face Republican, the Republican governor in November joined in the criticism. Governor Greg Abbott was duped by Russian bots. He indulged in awful conspiracy theories against our own men and women in uniform. That is true. He was a puppet in a Russian info war that sowed distrust amongst Americans and paved the way for foreign intervention in our elections. Former Dallas County Sheriff Lupe Valdez said in a statement, this is who is lecturing us on being smart on security and integrity in our electoral process. Houston businessman Andrew White said on Twitter that Abbott thought the movie Red Dawn was really happening, except with USA forces invading the USA. Truth? Russia fooled Greg into calling out the State Guard. Hmm. Well, very interesting. Still a lot more to be explored in hashing that one out, but an uh, interesting thought nonetheless. Not that I really want to cast my lot with Michael Hayden, if I can help it, but a funny thought. And in this day and age, I guess almost anything is worth at least a brief look, so long as you take several grains of salt with you. More news, and we may be just doing sort of lightning-ish roundup with brief pauses to read entire articles. Uh, ProPublica, one of my favorites these days, has this, and I always I appreciate their their angle on things, and I always I, I you know I think I like their headlines too. Whoops, this one reads: Kushner, Jared Kushner, made even more mistakes. Uh oh, in his federal filings. He made a mistake, everybody. Who who could have predicted? Yeah, well, anyway, it keeps happening. Jared Kushner filed the wrong information about two of his loans in Brooklyn. He has to update his disclosure form, uh, and this would be at least the fortieth, fortieth time that he's had to do it. Justin Elliott has this story and uh we'll give you a little bit of detail on it, but then continue on, I think, with our lightning round. Jared Kushner's ethnic, ethic, well, ethnic, why not? An ethnic disclosure filing. Eventually you'll have to file one of those in the United States anyway. Ethics disclosure form. Uh, misstated the financials on two Brooklyn loans, the latest in a long series of errors and omissions on the form. A Kushner representative confirmed the errors, attributing them to data entry and accounting mistakes. They didn't proofread any of these things. And what's amazing is, like at 39 corrections, do you say, should I look at the rest of this thing and see whether the numbers are right? Nah, there couldn't be a 40th one, right? Quite honestly, at that point, I'd be saying, I'm sure we got it all at this point, haven't we? Oh, no, a 40th one? Damn. That really is embarrassing. Uh, do you care what the uh, what the properties were? Maybe you live nearby. They are uh, they center on a pair of loans that Kushner Companies made to projects at 215 Moore Street in Bushwick and 9 DeKalb Avenue in downtown Brooklyn. So go take some pictures, I guess, and share them with us on the internet. Kushner's disclosure suggests that these loans could have generated more income from interest in a roughly year-long period than the entire value of the loans themselves. That's 
sounds like maybe backwards or fishy in a weird way. Uh, it's not a long piece. Uh, maybe we'll read the rest. A Kushner representative said the correct income ranges are 50000 to $100,000 on the 9 DeKalb loan and fifteen to 50000 on the 215 Moore loan. The loans were part of a push by Kushner companies announced in 2016 to get into the business of lending money to other developers. The company has now exited from both of these loans. The lender on the Moore project in Bushwick is now Bank of Internet, as we previously reported. That's, that's it, Bank of Internet. Uh, red flag. I would be looking into that one. That sounds like bank of internet. What do you mean? Why are you, why, why are you so interested in doing this? Uh, and I'm not kidding either. I'm still not clear whether Kushner companies had undisclosed partners in its lending program. The more to two, uh, the loan to 215 more was for more than $30 million, but Kushner's disclosure on the loan gives it a value of just a hundred thousand to $250,000. Kushner's representative told ProPublica that the value represents Kushner's share. A separate form that Kushner filed to get security clearance, good job on that one, has also not uh, a bit, or rather, has also been marked by numerous omissions and revisions, most famously involving his meetings with foreign contacts, including Russian officials and Bank of Internet. What is that one? Let's just kind of quickly open that one up. ProPublica is reporting on Bank of Internet, which had been under federal investigation for some unknown reason, appears in multiple Kushner deals. The bank most recently played a role in a transaction involving Kushner company loans in Brooklyn. That from April 30th. Just sort of curious scanning this Bank of Internet. Bank of Internet USA. That was previously what it was known at in a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, has no exposure or relationship with Mr. Kushner or his company with respect to 215 Moore Street. Uh, I'm just curious, like, what is the provenance of Bank of Internet and where did it come from? Based in San Diego, the publicly traded B of I Federal does most of its real estate lending in California. It has only a small presence in the New York market. It has attracted attention from short-selling investors who question the bank's business model and practices. The company has said the investors have purveyed misleading information. <gasps> no. Um, hmm, let's see. So, uh, in November of 2016, shortly after the presidential election, Kushner Companies announced it was pursuing a new line of business, lending money to other developers' projects. That month, the company made a loan of at least $33 million to a well-known New York developer, Toby Moskowitz, for a project in Brooklyn. That guy's... Name sounds somewhat familiar, although we were, is it not a guy? Is it a woman? Is that the, the picture is there? I guess so. Toby Moskowitz, this time uh, spelled with an S on the end, from Heritage Equity Partners. She's the chief executive, and I got the gender wrong, as sometimes happens. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Well, very interesting. It uh, doesn't jump out at me right away as something Absolutely horrible, but uh, if you're involved with the Kushner guys and have such a dumb name, Bank of Internet, I think, uh, well, the they were under investigation by the SEC at some point. Okay, well, we'll just put that one in the back pocket. I'll give you a link to it. You can investigate it yourself. And now, on to more news, because there's just so much going on here. Uh, I'll turn to Slate for... Their oops, uh, their coverage of the House Chaplain story. Just to bring you up to speed on that one, House Chaplain rescinds resignation in scorching letter to Paul Ryan. So that's the one rescission that actually will take place, I guess, in Congress this year, despite the fact that Donald Trump insists that they will uh, Congress will pass a rescissions package later on. Jim Newell, writing for Slate. Brings us this one. Is it a long piece? No, relatively short. The chaplain of the House of Representatives, whose ouster by Speaker Paul Ryan blew up the Capitol last week. I, I, I just want to isolate that piece without context. Paul Ryan blew up the Capitol last week. Arrest him. Arrest his musical toes. I've been using that on the uh, on the Twitter machine lately, by the way. Everyone recognizes that one from, uh, what is that one? Uh, uh, Santa Claus is coming to town, the old uh, claymation one. Anyway. Uh, he blew up the Capitol last week and he, the, uh, the chaplain has rescinded the resignation, which he had previously submitted at Ryan's request. 
And Ryan, in a statement issued late Thursday afternoon, says that he has, quote, accepted Father Conroy's letter and decided that he will remain in his position as chaplain of the House. It's always about him. In a two-page letter sent to the Speaker on Thursday, Conroy had claimed that Ryan's chief of staff, Jonathan Burks, suggested that the Republican leadership would prefer to have a chaplain who wasn't Catholic. Yow. Conroy, uh, Conroy's letter mentions, as has been previously reported, that it was Burks who came to see him on April 13th, Friday the 13th, asking for a letter of resignation. I inquired as to whether or not it was for cause, Conroy writes, and Mr. Burks mentioned dismissively something like, maybe it's time that we had a chaplain that wasn't Catholic. Woo! Man. Uh, I know some people who are going to be angry about that, who are pretty certain that I was anti-Catholic and uh, spent uh, some time trying to make that a popular theme on the Internet. You should go with this guy. Burks also mentioned Conroy's November prayer on tax reform. That was alleged to be part of the reason, which some viewed as hostile to the GOP legislation, as well as an interview with the National Journal Daily that some Republicans didn't appreciate. I'd be interested in what that one is. I strongly disagree with Father Conroy's recollection of our conversation, Burke said in a statement late Thursday. I'm disappointed at the misunderstanding, but wish him the best as he continues to serve the House. Sure. Conroy also takes issue with Ryan's public argument that the firing was because Conroy wasn't meeting members' pastoral needs. In fact, no such criticism has ever been leveled against me during my tenure as House chaplain, he writes. At the very least, if it were, I could have attempted to correct such faults in retracting my resignation i wish to do that i'm not so certain about how well this is really going to work out but okay he adds that he doesn't want his resignation to be construed as a constructive termination you may wish to outright fire me if you have the authority to do so but should you wish to terminate my services it will be without my offer of resignation he says this i mean why didn't he do this the first time i don't know Father Conroy's forced resignation hit on tensions between Catholic and Protestant Republicans on the Hill. His letter rescinding that resignation will make it much, much worse. My original decision was made in what I believe to be the best interest of this institution, Ryan said in his statement. To be clear, that decision was based on my duty to ensure that the House has the kind of pastoral services that it deserves. Does it really need any? It's my job as Speaker to do what is best for this body, and I know that this body is not well served by a protracted fight over such an important post. He will meet with Conroy for confession, I suppose, next week. Interesting and well worth getting up to date on. Uh, Let's see. Uh, A story that we only briefly mentioned the other day uh, has now been given some analysis on Twitter by uh, Wendy Siegelman, independent journalist who occasionally writes for BuzzFeed uh, and who's uh, quite a Trump Russia hound and one who I don't think has gotten that super far out in front of stories and facts in the past in the same way that my worries uh, lead me to believe is the case with some other Twitter active Trump Russia hounds. But let's see, she was taking a look into the story we mentioned the other day, and only just briefly, about the weapons sales to Ukraine and what sort of quid pro quo might have been going on there. Uh, We'll get right to the heart of the matter rather than stopping and reading the Dry Toast article that set the whole thing off. Wendy Siegelman tweeting yesterday, Trump was convinced to sell lethal weapons to Ukraine, missiles, in fact, and helicopters as well. And then he screwed up the whole announcement. But anyway... Trump was convinced to sell lethal weapons to Ukraine, thanks in part to a savvy charm offensive from Kiev. But the deal may be more bark than bite. This is an article that she includes in the tweet from Natasha Bertrand, which I'll open up here. Ukraine's successful courtship of Trump. Again, a leap past the dry toast to the juicy stuff. Trump was convinced to sell lethal weapons to Ukraine, thanks in part to this savvy charm offensive from Kiev. Uh, This again, Natasha Bertrand's piece from yesterday. The United States completed its shipment of Javelin anti-tank missiles to Ukraine on Monday. A a rare, like, actual delivery and finalization in one of these things. Finalizing a sale that was reluctantly approved hmm, by President Donald Trump in November. Why was it reluctantly approved? Because Ukraine is not Russia, and the Russians might worry about the Ukrainians getting a hold of anti-tank missiles 
to be uh, that could be used in repelling any Russian invasion, planned or not. The deal was widely reported as a rebuke to Russian President Vladimir Putin, and that's what really worried him. It was reported as a rebuke, who annexed Crimea and invaded eastern Ukraine in 2014. I should say, I guess, further uh, invasion of Ukraine, planned or otherwise. Whether they really have those plans or not, I don't know. This decision reflects our country's longstanding commitment to Ukraine in the face of ongoing Russian aggression, Republican Senator Bob Corker said late last year. You're not going to find Donald Trump saying that. But the terms of the arrangement show it may be more bark than bite. The weapons, quote, have been delivered to a secure facility in Ukraine, not the line of conflict, although I don't know why we would have to be responsible for delivering them to the front lines. That, according to Kurt Volker, the U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine, he did not elaborate further, but the Wall Street Journal reported in January that the weapons would be stored in training centers in western Ukraine that will be monitored by American soldiers. Really? Trump has said repeatedly that, quote, no one is tougher on Russia than him. But his critics have accused him of challenging Putin only superficially. Shortly after the Trump administration expelled 60 Russian diplomats in March, 48 of whom were actually intelligence officers, according to a State Department spokesman, the State Department acknowledged that the Kremlin would be allowed to refill the vacated positions presumably with people who aren't intelligence officers, but what will happen is they will be refilled with people who say they're not intelligence officers, but are. Oh, well, the Treasury Department recently sanctioned more than three dozen Russian oligarchs, officials, and entities who profit from Russia's malign activity and corrupt system. Those are quotes. But many of the sanctioned oligarchs had four months' notice to move their money, thanks to a list of Russia's wealthiest individuals released by the Treasury in January. That money might already be back in Russia. As they say, a barking dog cannot hinder a caravan's journey. I, I guess they say that in Russia, because Putin is the one who said it. He told that to the TASS news agency at the time. He mocked his own absence from the list. <laughs> when U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley announced new sanctions against Russia over its support for embattled Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, she was contradicted by the White House hours later. You remember that, of course. And you remember that when uh, no one was tougher on Russia, Donald Trump had to come up with a list of oligarchs to sanction he just used like one of the Forbes magazine or one, uh, some money magazine's list of the richest people in Russia rather than do any actual research. Hmm. There is confusion about the Putin-Trump relationship. Major General Volodymyr Har uh, Havrilov, I'm going to guess, Ukraine's defense attache to the U.S. told me last month, and an element of unpredictability. But we believe in checks and balances in the United States. Hmm. Former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis pushed for Trump to approve the lethal weapons sale to Ukraine, according to Havrilov and other, another U.S. official familiar with the deal who requested anonymity. Trump was convinced, at least in part, by the fact that President Barack Obama, to whom Trump frequently compares himself, had balked at the sale. Aha. Uh -huh. The official relayed a conversation between Trump and Ukrainian President uh, Petro Poroshenko last year, in which Trump asked why Obama had done nothing when Russia invaded Crimea. Trump, ever transactional, also wanted to make sure he was not giving away something for nothing. The U.S. officials said it was emphasized to the president that this would be a sale, not a gift, and Poroshenko won favor with Trump by facilitating an $80 million coal deal the first between the U.S. and Ukraine, that was politically expedient for both leaders. In February, Ukrainian Railways signed a $1 billion locomotive deal with GE Transportation. Trump had promised during the campaign to revitalize the U.S. rail industry, and coal industry as well. The Trump administration is very much focused on jobs creation, said Daniel uh, Vaid Vaidich, the president of the strategic advisory firm Yorktown Solutions. So naturally, Ukraine has thought about its ability to help create jobs for Americans in the context of creating leverage by feeding into Trump's policy desires. A Ukrainian-American lobbyist who spoke to me on condition of anonymity put it more bluntly, Poroshenko has become a hostage of Trump, he told me. Well, the article goes on at some length. We'll return to Wendy Siegelman's tweet storm about it and other pieces of information she's woven together. 
uh, well, after our next and last and upcoming break, uh, let's see, just sort of scanning through here, see if there's another tidbit we can cram in here before the break. In June of 2017, Poroshenko attempted to pique the administration's interest in helping to end the war in Ukraine by offering U.S. construction firms 90% of all contracts to repair and rebuild infrastructure in the disputed Donbass region, according to the Russian newspaper Kommersant. How about that one? Well, we'll pick it up again on the other side of the break and try for some more. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I decided to wait for the music to end this time. Actually scanning through, trying to find the best tidbits to bring you. And I think the thing to do here, a lot of the what's at the top here of Wendy Siegelman's tweet storm is grabbing the salient parts from Natasha Bertrand's article. So at this point, we'll jump out of the reading of the entirety of the article and return to Wendy's tweet storm about it. Remember, she begins with this piece and saying Trump was convinced to sell lethal weapons to Ukraine thanks in part to the savvy charm offensive from Kiev. That's actually the subheader of the piece. The Ukrainian government, she notes, Wendy does, uh, hired Haley Barber, former RNC chairman and uh, governor of Mississippi, right, Uh, and founding partner of BGR Group which uh, is not to be confused with uh, the BGR restaurant, Burger Joint, which was uh, really nice while we had one here, but it closed recently in my neighborhood. Uh, Neither here nor there. Founding partner of BGR Group, uh, the Ukrainian government hired him to lobby in the U.S. after Trump was elected. Barber slash BGR were also lobbyists for Mikhail Friedman's Alpha Bank. You remember them? For 10 years. Uh, And accompanying here, A screen grab, I guess, to establish the point. Screen grab from Natasha Bertrand's piece. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, By the way, uh, in the Atlantic, Natasha's writing was appearing. The Ukrainian government hired Haley Barber, former RNC chair, founding partner of BGR Group, to lobby in the U.S., right? Ed Rogers, the chairman of BGR, was hired for the lobbying work, too. The firm has ties to the White House. The Trump transition team held meetings with lobbyists at BGR Group's offices according to the Washington Post. And Rogers is as inner circle Jeff Sessions as they come. A source with knowledge of their relationship told me on condition of anonymity, referring to, of course, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Both men are from Alabama. BGR also worked with Corey Lewandowski, who's now back on the inside, by the way. Trump's former campaign manager, who still visits the White House regularly, as recently as last summer, the Daily Beast reported. That news of his being back on the inside comes from a totally separate tweet I saw elsewhere, uh, alleging that he would be joining Donald Trump in a 2018 midterm elections barnstorming trip of sorts on behalf of Republican candidates. But Donald Trump doesn't like to travel around all that much unless he's going to the golf course. So I question about, you know, how much of it. Well, you know, no president really hits the road tirelessly all the time for Republican or other candidates of, of their own party. Either way, I mean, some have more energy than others. But uh, anyway, uh, Siegelman continues here with this. I wrote more in the article below, which she includes in her tweet, co-written with... Uh, James Patrick, and uh, this was about Haley Barber and his work with Alpha Bank and his how his successor as governor of Mississippi, Phil Bryant, was the one who introduced Nigel Farage to Trump. Farage, I guess. I don't know why I always put an N in that. Uh, yeah, and here it is. Uh, hmm. 
thread from an article I wrote on Mississippi, Russia, Trump, and Farage as well. Uh, so you'll see that in the tweet storm, which will include it in a roundup. As Natasha Bertrand noted in the story above, Barber worked with Corey Lewandowski. Barber has been an advisor and Lewandowski a lobbyist for Imperial Pacific International, which built a casino in Saipan, which was raided by U.S. agents in March of this year. And again, an article embedded here. To provide some proof, Haley Barber connects with another story by Natasha Bertrand about Sam Patton, who worked for Cambridge Analytica. And in a scoop by, uh oh, we're going to have to look up this uh, Twitter handle here. I, uh, I'm the Mad- Madridista. <laughs> uh, I don't know who that is, but okay, that's the Twitter handle and it doesn't uh, identify. Anyway, in a scoop by I'm the Madridista, Sam Patton set up a company with Manafort's business partner and ex-GRU agent Konstantin Kalimnik. There really are an awful lot of threads, or uh, not to be confused with the fact that this, these tweets are threaded. All a lot of loose threads to be tugged at in all of this. So are we clear on how this is progressing? Let's just make sure we keep it in uh, linear fashion here. The Ukrainian government hires Haley Barber. Who works at the B, who founded the BGR Group, and worked who also worked for Alpha Bank for ten years, and uh, Haley Barber's successor as governor of Mississippi, Phil Bryant, was the one who introduced Nigel Farage to Trump. Why I don't know. How I don't know. Uh, Barber also worked with Corey Lewandowski as a lobbyist for Imperial Pacific International, which built a casino in Saipan, which was raided by U.S. agents. Haley Barber connects with another story by Natasha Bertrand about Sam Patton, who worked for Cambridge Analytica. Sam Patton set up a company with Paul Manafort's business partner and ex-GRU agent Konstantin Kalimnik. Haley Barber, back to him, whose firm BGR was a lobbyist for Alpha Bank, also worked with Sam Patton. Cambridge Analytica contractor and Konstantin Kalimnik business partner. Patton worked with BGR to lobby for Georgian businessman, not next door, Georgia, USA, but Georgia, former Soviet Republic, Bidzina Ivanishvili in 2012. Article there to attached as well. So certainly something that we could all spend some weekend time reading up on. And Wendy, with a good organizational mind, attaching and connecting all of these threads to see if there is something that we can uh, dig out of this. All right, moving on from that one, just so that you're aware, a uh, couple of very interesting observations and a few good articles, We might short ones, we might be able to squeeze in. First one, good observation here from Ronald Klain on Twitter, and we did just call his name the other day, right? Former Ebola czar. Uh, Just remember, he says, it was Trump's favorite justice, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who he brutally murdered in Texas, by the way. Uh, People sometimes say, a lot of people are saying this. It's not true, but a lot of people are saying that I smothered him with a pillow. Uh, Just remember, it was Trump's favorite justice, Scalia, who specifically cited golf playing during a Supreme Court argument as to why he believed that the president is too busy to be questioned argument was baloney. Do you remember that? Does it happen to ring a bell for you? If not, it's okay, of course. They're making the same argument now, uh, Rudy Giuliani and other attorneys, and in in this case specifically John Dowd, who we talked about the other day, and uh, Armando had to correct me about which of the attorneys it was, saying, you know, this is not some game. You're screwing with the ability of the president of the United States to do his job. And about no one could such a argument be more hilarious and ridiculous than about Donald Trump, who, of course, has been golfing a hundred times as president and is famously watching television four hours a day every morning and rage tweeting at the TV rather than doing his job. Uh, Probably less time on the job than any president, certainly in modern history, anyway. So, interesting, though. Yes, it was Scalia uh, presented with, I don't know what, was his, uh, what was it? It must have been during the Clinton, in, you know, the Clinton investigations while the president is too busy to be interviewed in the Paula Jones case. Baloney, he's playing golf. 
Well, okay. Uh, Scalia, of course, that's why he murdered Scalia, so that he wouldn't be on the bench to say, baloney, you can't be questioned, you're playing golf all the time. Not that Scalia would have been willingly that consistent, but uh, probably a good clean end to things just to uh, smother him with that pillow after all. Of course, I'm not saying he did it. I'm just saying lots of people are talking about it. That's fine, as far as I know. The First Amendment right to do that or something, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, let's see. A couple of articles that I think would be wise to share. Mm, and I'm trying to see if there's any other sort of uh, quickies to to shovel onto the pile here. And there are. We'll get to them. Let me first... Uh, grab up this one here. Talking points memo. Uh, Josh Marshall's, the personal side of it from him. I, I, it's, it's the editor's blog. Back when uh, TPM was just a blog, it was just this. But now, of course, it's a worldwide empire. But uh, Josh Marshall shares this, I think, very interesting insight. An MO for other more serious crimes. A little bit of a reader's, anonymous reader's, analysis that Josh thought important to share in the wake of yesterday's Giuliani excitement. Read what this person says, Josh says. I cannot identify the person, but I can vouch for the expertise. And here it is, just one long block quote, or I guess several. I know everyone has a take on this Rudy slash Cohen S-word show, crap show, but I thought I would give you some perspective from someone steeped in anti-corruption enforcement, both domestic and foreign, on the prosecution and defense side. As we already know, this should be good, as we already know, Michael Cohen is the prototypical fixer or bag man. In Mexico, as discussed in glorious detail in this New York Times expose on Walmart's massive corruption scandal in Mexico, and we have not paid attention to that one, but it's from all the way back in 2012, so that's probably why. A lawyer fixer like Cohen would be known as a gestore, which I gave a more Italian pronunciation, perhaps. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know, would they, in, in Mexico, would they say ge, like gestore? I don't know. The bag man's job is to get bribe money to people while insulating and giving deniability to the ultimate payor of the bribe. Having a dirty lawyer as a bagman provides a number of advantages. First, bribe money can be laundered from the, quote, client through the lawyer as fictitious legal services. The lawyer can issue bogus invoices to the client in amounts sufficient to cover bribe payments, a commission to the lawyer, and a gross up, a gross gross payment plus something, for any taxes the lawyer would have to pay on the fee income. Bag men, after all, don't want to be stuck paying taxes on the amounts they pay out as bribes. Sound familiar? It does, in fact, and of course it describes the dynamics of what happened in the Trump-Cohen-Stormy Daniels relationship as well. But it also sounds familiar uh, in terms of money laundering, you know, fake uh, fictitious legal services that can be valued at any 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 amount you want. There's you know no it can be made arbitrary. I'm just a very expensive lawyer, or this is just a very expensive uh, Persian rug, antique Persian rug that we're using to launder money, or this uh, piece of New York luxury real estate could be valued at whatever, or this decrepit mansion could be sold for ninety five million dollars, or whatever. Just saying. Sounds familiar. Yes, it does. Second, by disguising the bribes as payments for legal fees, businesses can try to write them off as expenses. Bribes, on the other hand, are not deductible, of course. This is a tax evasion, of course, but it is common practice for the corrupt. And that makes some sense. Third, the lawyer-client relationship can be an impediment to law enforcement. In fact, that's what they were hoping would be the case. That was Hence the complaints about the raids on Cohen's office, home, and hotel room. So the, you can make it worth any amount you want. It's a good way of laundering payments and still giving a commission to the lawyer. It can uh, disguise bribes as payments for legal fees, make them deductible as expenses, and 
can uh, provide an impediment to law enforcement by invoking the lawyer-client relationship should anyone come poking around. So now we have Giuliani confirming that this is exactly how Trump and Cohen operated. Hush money to Stormy Daniels is one thing, as Ari Fleischer would argue, and certainly raises potential serious campaign finance violations, which Ari Fleischer would dispute. But she, Stormy Daniels, is not a public official. What I find most significant about Rudy's admission is what it says about the nature of the relationship between Trump and Cohen and how it suggests an M.O. for other more serious crimes. Trump is a major real estate developer in New York, which Armando would dispute, who has openly bragged about his ability to cut through red tape and get politicians in his pocket. We now have serious Southern District of New York public corruption prosecutors and other FBI agents, uh, no other, and FBI agents in possession of a massive amount of electronic data from his bag man. They likely already have all of his financial records as well. And Rudy has now given them the roadmap for how Trump may have laundered bribes through Cohen as purported legal fees or retainer payments. Every invoice Cohen has ever issued to Trump is now suspect. Every corrupt payment Cohen has ever made or facilitated to building inspectors, councilmen, porn stars, yes, or whomever can be potentially tied back now to Trump, whomever, whatever payments they are, they're all tieable to Trump now because he didn't have any other clients. In addition, I suspect Trump and his kids had a false sense of comfort that their communications with Cohen would be privileged. I am convinced this is why Trump and his family are freaking out about the Cohen raid and the possibility that he could flip. That seems obvious. The Southern District of New York is sitting on the mother load of evidence and Rudy has given them the connection between purported legal fees and payments by Cohen to third parties. And that's true. It is, of course, at the same time, both a key to unlocking the, you know, secret fake books ledger, I guess, to draw a parallel to the untouchables. Uh, but also, I mean, I think Rudy Giuliani, to the extent that he's actually working uh, to the benefit of Donald Trump in any way, shape or form, and it's not absolutely necessarily the case. Uh, he also is setting up an argument that basically and, and, and when it comes to prosecuting a president of the United States, they're going to be looking for any technicality or any shading or any doubt that they can cast on these things and say, who's to say that this wasn't really in exchange for legal services and that those legal services might be tremendously expensive. The argument against it is, well, but Michael Cohen is a terrible lawyer. He barely practices law at all. He has no clients to speak of other than this guy. And he loses everything. He loses in every case, just as Trump as you know, you, you've seen what happens when he took over the government. He loses almost every case he's involved in. He has no idea how to be a fixer, political or otherwise. But it will cast enough doubt, just as we really don't think that Scott Pruitt, though caught red handed in, in something that everybody understands to be, you know, run of the mill corruption, run of the mill in the sense that it's, you know, it, it's pretty blatant and obvious and meets everybody's definition of corruption. But he won't go to jail about it because uh, when push comes to shove and it enters the realm of the courtroom, everyone will come up with stupid excuses like, well, hey, he was trying to study environmental procedures in other countries. That's like a legitimate inquiry. Yeah, but why is he going here and going there? Oh, he was going to pay back the government for that. Yeah, sure, whatever. But, you know, in a court of law, yeah, okay, we're going to have to let him go. And here, well, I just have an expensive lawyer. I was buying Persian rugs, antique Persian rugs. People will pay whatever they want to pay for real estate. That's the market. It creates doubt. But it is interesting that it also happens to follow the pattern for which they're able to convict much less famous and much less powerful people all the time. So interesting and worth a moment's reflection. Another piece that I set aside that I thought might make a fine uh, entry into the weekend from Martin Longman in Washington Monthly, 
who does what we all ought to do from time to time, reviewing his old writings, uh, and brings us this piece. What Trump did to win a tower in Moscow. Now, we all know that he was trying to build a Trump Tower in Moscow in 2013 and continued to try to do it up through 2016. But this uh, synthesis that Martin has put together here, I think, is valuable for evaluating the collusion question um, and at the same time explains why a an idiot and a cheater like Donald Trump would think that there really is no evidence of collusion and also addresses the questions that I think a lot smarter people who happen to be skeptics uh, of this and, and pretty much of everything and say, I really haven't seen it nailed down. Why would Donald Trump really be doing all these things on behalf of the Russians uh, if I, for instance, don't believe anything about the P-tape being real or them having any real compromise on him? Uh, why would you know what, what explanation exists then? And I, I think this offers a glimpse into the possibility. Again, what Trump did to win a tower in Moscow, as many expected they would. Things are picking up steam on a variety of fronts as spring moves towards summer, and it gets closer to the time when Robert Mueller discloses what he's discovered in his investigations of Donald Trump, his campaign, and his businesses. You can easily anticipate that we'll soon reach a boiling, a rolling boil as disclosures and new legal actions arrive with a new fire and fury to their pace. And indeed, that is happening. We can barely keep up as it is. He continues, there will be surprises like the news today, yesterday, that the special counsel's office is focused on Roger Stone's relationship with Rick Gates, who is a cooperating witness in this case. And we haven't talked about that yet. I did see that news fly by and it seemed Interesting, because Stone's an interesting guy, to say the least, but still a little extraneous. Now, Martin continues here. Collusion, of course, isn't a legal term, and to some degree it's hard to define. For most people, collusion has already been demonstrated several times over, but the eyes of the beholders can differ on the significance, and it also depends on how much information you can hold in your head at one time. That's an interesting theory, too, right? I mean, they could... Uh, be flooding the zone such that when not only can we not pay significant uh, or enough attention to any one or another of the many scandals, but so much information flying by, keeping track of it was almost impossible. And if you actually did manage to keep track of it in, say, chart form, people would look at it and say, oh, my God, it looks like some wacko thing from a beautiful mind. As I said just yesterday in dismissing somebody else's work, perhaps unfairly. Hmm. Something to think about. Anyway, let's just read what Martin has to say here. Uh, it depends on how much information you can hold in your head at one time. When I look back in my archives, he writes, I'm constantly shocked at how much I've written about and then simply forgotten. I find that I need to give myself occasional refreshers. And that's why I went back and looked at a good resource CNN put together that collated 80 separate mentions Donald Trump made of Vladimir Putin during and before his campaign for the presidency. They put them on a timeline that is handy when new revelations come out. Late last August, the New York Times broke the story that Donald Trump had been in negotiations to build a tower in Moscow in the fall and winter of 2015, despite his repeated claims that he had no business interests in Russia. As part of that piece, they reported on emails that had been exchanged between Felix Sater and Michael Cohen. Here's a fragment from an email exchange about the Trump Tower project that took place about exactly one year before the presidential election. Here it is. It reads, Michael and I arranged for Ivanka to sit in Putin's private chair at his desk and office in the Kremlin. I will get Putin on this program and we will get Donald elected. We both know no one else knows how to pull this off without stupidity or greed getting in the way. Sorry about that. Wrong. I know how to play it and we will get this done. Buddy, our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it. I will get all of Putin's team to buy in on this. That's the part we usually hear about. The part about the private chair. Hmm, interesting, but... Uh, as a whole. What does this mean? It should go without saying that it wouldn't help Sater and Cohen's cause if Trump were to say bad things about Russia on the campaign trail while they were trying to get Putin to sign off on the deal. 
Sater even had advice on that front. Mr. Sater said he was eager to show video clips to his Russian contacts of instances of Mr. Trump speaking glowingly about Russia. This, of course, from the New York Times. And he said he would arrange for Mr. Putin to praise Mr. Trump's business acumen. If he says it, we own this election, Mr. Sater wrote. America's most difficult adversary agreeing that Donald is a good guy to negotiate. Probably means negotiate with. So Sater was telling Cohen that he wanted Trump to say nice things about Putin so that he could show the clips to his Russian contacts. What was Trump saying about Putin in November and December of 2015? Well, this is from November 10th, 2015. Asked a, at a Republican debate what he would do as president in response to Russian aggression. Trump said, well, first of all, it's not only Russia. We have problems with North Korea where they actually have nuclear weapons. You know, nobody talks about it. We talk about Iran. And that's one of the worst deals ever made. So we have more than just Russia. Now, he went on to say, I got to know Putin very well because we were both on 60 Minutes. We were stable mates and we did very well that night. But you know that. But if Putin wants to knock the hell out of ISIS, I'm all for it, 100 percent. And I can't understand how anybody would be against that, he added. Martin continues, notice he distracted attention away from the issue of Russian aggression. Then he said that Russia's intentions in Syria were strictly about countering terrorism and that he fully supported Russia's escalation there. And of course, he said he had a great relationship with Putin because they'd both been featured on the same episode, but different segments, of 60 Minutes, as if that meant they'd actually met or talked. In truth, he's been saying he had a great relationship with Putin ever since he got back from the 2013 pageant in Moscow. Now, here's what he said about Putin in December 18th, 2015. Trump said on Morning Joe that Putin was a better leader than Obama and dismissed Joe Scarborough's allegations that the Russian president, quote, kills journalists that he don't uh, that don't agree with him. He's running his country and at least he's a leader, unlike what we have in this country, Trump said. He added, I think our country does plenty of killing also, Joe, so you know. There's a lot of stupidity going on in the world right now. We've got a lot of killing going on, a lot of stupidity. This exchange raised a lot of eyebrows at the time because Trump was asserting that Putin's treatment of journalists was somehow comparable to how journalists are treated in the U.S. If not before, at this point, a lot of people began to question whether Trump had some financial reason for not wanting to criticize Russia or Putin. There was a lot of pushback on Trump. But on December 20th, 2015, he doubled down. In an interview with ABC's This Week, Trump defends against allegations Putin has ordered the killings of journalists and dissidents. As far as the reporters are concerned, as far as the reporters are concerned, obviously I don't want that to happen. I think it's terrible, horrible. But in all fairness to Putin, you're saying he killed people. I haven't seen that. I don't know that he has. Have you been able to prove that? Do you know the names of the reporters that he's killed? Because I've been, you know, you've been hearing this, but I haven't seen the name. Now, I think it would be despicable if that took place, but I haven't seen any evidence that he killed anybody in terms of reporters. He provided Felix Sater with another clip the next day, December 21st, telling Iowa radio host Simon Conway, I've always had a good instinct about Putin. I just feel that that's a guy, and I can analyze people, and you're not always right, but it could be that I don't like him. But I've always had a good feeling about him from the standpoint. On December 30th, he defended his kind words for Putin by pointing out that Putin had some kind words about him. You remember that. What am I going to do? Attack the guy? He says, uh, he says, um, brilliant. The effort to build a tower in Moscow was shut down in December, probably because it began to look like Trump might actually have a chance to win the Republican nomination. But if you consult the timeline, and that's what this is all about. You'll see that Trump's rhetoric and policies toward Russia continued to be inexplicably conciliatory and supplicating. All this was prior, as far as we know, to any coordination over the release of damaging information the Russians had collected or soon would collect on Hillary Clinton and members of her campaign. What it shows, however, is that Trump was using his early time on the campaign to ingratiate himself with Vladimir Putin in the hope that it would land him a deal to build a tower in Moscow. 
It didn't hurt, certainly, that his primary target early on was Jeb Bush and other neoconservatives like Marco Rubio, who were hated and feared by the Kremlin, nor that he was blasting away at Hillary Clinton, who Vladimir Putin hated with a white-hot passion. Pretty much his whole message, though, was tailor-made to please the Russians. The whole point, at least initially, was to get help from the Russians. Now, at first, the help sought was business-related. And then, later on, it became about winning the primaries and ultimately the presidency. Trump provided the clips, Sater provided the contacts, Cohen acted as the go-between. So, what do you think the feds found in Cohen's papers and on his computers and on his phones? That, I think, ties it all nicely together. It wasn't always, let's interfere in the United States elections and make the long shot Trump president of the United States. It was a business deal. It only later became about interfering in the election itself. From Daily Coast Radio, on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Kegro in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. What's coming up next on the West Coast Book Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam? Well, there's plenty. Allison Camerota and Anna Navarro slamming Jason Miller's sycophantic attacks was like, quote, watching two women kick a stuttering gopher. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. If you don't, then stay tuned. Justice will explain it to you. We'll see you next week.